So today I'm going to be talking about whether we've finally reached consensus on how to solve the problem of distributed consensus. Distributed consensus is one of the most fundamental problems in distributed computing. It's a part of every distributed computing course in uh, computer science undergraduate and graduate, and it's famously a really, really tricky problem to solve. But if we can solve it, wow, we can do so much. We can build distributed systems that are both consistent and reliable. That's absolutely amazing to me. And we do this in production all the time. We've got these two algorithms that dominate the uh, consensus systems that we have. These are Raft and Paxos. And today I'm gonna to be answering the very controversial question of whether Raft or Paxos is the better algorithm for solving distributed consensus. I'd like to say before I get started that this talk is based on a paper that I wrote with my colleague Richard Mortier at, also at the University of Cambridge. The paper has the same title as this talk, so if you just search for this online you can find the paper. It's in the ACM Digital Library, it's also available on Archive. I'm sure we can maybe get a link uh, sorted out in, some, in the chat as well for people that want to have a look and read some more about this topic. So there's this saying that nothing in, the, in life is certain except death and taxes. But if you've ever worked with computers, you'll know there's a third thing you should add to this list, and that is failures. In computing, failures are pervasive. They are absolutely the norm. And despite all the developments we've had in distributed computing over the decades, failures are in fact becoming more and more common. As systems scale, from 10 machines to 100 machines to 1,000 machines to tens of thousands of machines. Failures are going from being the exception to being the rule. This means that we have to deal with failures right from the outset. It's not a question of if a failure occur will occur, but a question of when a failure will occur. And no slide on the inevitability of failures would be complete without this infamous quote by Leslie Lampors. I read that it's often misquoted, so I actually took a screenshot of the email that he originally sent where he said that the first time. And specifically what he said is, a distributed is one in which the failure of a computer, which you didn't even know existed, can render your own computer unusable. So we have been building distributed systems with failures in mind for quite a while. And this is often because of um, things like the CAP theorem and the FLP result, which have kind of popularized, popularized the idea that when you're building a system, you have to choose the trade-offs you're gonna make right from the outset. Are you gonna prioritize performance? Are you gonna prioritize availability? Are you gonna prioritize consistency? And therefore, we see many different systems that take many different approaches to tolerating failures. In particular, they have many different consistency guarantees. So this figure, don't worry if you can't read it, uh, the text is quite small, it's just to illustrate the uh, number of different consistency levels that are available. This figure was taken from a paper called The Consistency of Non-Transactional Distributed Storage Systems, and it lists over 70 different consistency guarantees that are provided by systems, with everything from fork, star, red, green, blue, weak, snapshot, all these different um, snapshot star, all these different guarantees. And frankly, it's confusing. It's confusing to use this and it's even confusing to the developers and the maintainers of these systems. If you look at the work that, for example, Jepson has been doing in recent years, you can see how difficult it is to build a distributed system that um, provides a consistency guarantee uh, correctly and then correctly communicates what that consistency guarantee is to its users. I literally have a PhD in, in the field of distributed computing and I cut my head around all these guarantees. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to ignore all, all but one of them. I'm only going to look at the very top guarantee on this diagram. For those of you who can't see it, it's linearizability. This is the strongest guarantee that we can provide. This guarantee allows us to treat our distributed system as if it's just a single server, as if it's not distributed at all. We can ignore all that complexity of distributed systems and just focus on getting the job done. Linearizability guarantees that an operation will be executed atomically uh, 
exactly once at some point between when an operation was sent and when the response was received. That's simple enough. I can understand that. I can explain that. Um, the question, of course, is how to implement that. So the good news is that we can, in fact, implement that and we can implement it in such a way that we're not assuming that our hosts are up, that we're not assuming our servers won't fail, and we're not assuming that our network is synchronous. So we're not putting a bound on how quickly the network will deliver a message. We're not assuming that our clocks are synchronized. It's, it's frankly amazing that we can implement this really strong consistency guarantee under such a weak assumption model. The only thing we are assuming, however, is that our servers will execute the algorithm correctly. This is known as the non-Byzantine model. So state machine replication, you take an application that you can express as a deterministic state machine and you replicate it. Well, it basically, it does what it says on the tin. You've got these, in this case, you've got three state machines. And what you need to do is you need to ensure that every state machine seems the same sequence of operations in the same order. And so we've got this replicated log that's going to store the operations and then their replicated log is going to pass the operations to the state machine. Great, right? Except all we've done is swap one hard problem in computer science, how to implement linearizability, for another famously hard problem in computer science, how to solve consensus. Because we need a way of implementing this replicated log. We need a way of uh, deciding an ordering of operations between these three servers. And we want to still be able to tolerate a server failure and tolerate asynchrony. And this is not just something that I kind of would talk about in theory papers. This is not just something I made up. This is absolutely pervasive in production systems all over the place are using this. A couple of big examples would be the Chubby system at Google. So this is the lock server that Google it uses widely uh, in production and puts a lot of trust and a lot of faith into, which implements an algorithm called Paxos. Also, we've got things like etcd. etcd is a strongly consistent key value store that's used by Kubernetes, which is probably a familiar name to many of you, um, which is an algorithm called RAF. In fact, when we look at what's going on in production, we can divide the systems that we have into two teams. On one hand, we've got Team Paxos. So these are the systems that implement an algorithm known as Paxos for solving distributed consensus. On the other hand, we've got Team Raft. These are the algorithms that implement Raft instead of Paxos for solving distributed consensus. And almost all systems fit into one of these two camps. So let's take a closer look at each of these two algorithms. First off, in the blue corner, we have Paxos. Uh, throughout this talk, when I'm talking about Paxos, I'm going to use blue. When I'm talking about Raft, I'm going to use red to make it extra clear when I'm talking about one or the other. So in the blue corner, we have Paxos. Paxos, was, uh, it, Paxos is the classic textbook gold standard solution to solving distributed consensus that is absolutely pervasive. It was published in this paper called Part-Time Parliament by Leslie Lamport. And he later wrote a follow-up paper, Paxos Made Simple, which removed some of the Greek, quite literally, from this paper um, and was more targeted at engineers. But this was the original paper that it was described in. So it was published in 1998, the ACM Transactions of Computer Science, and it has 3,000 citations, um, which is pretty incredible. It makes it one of the most cited uh, papers in, in distributed computing. And having a quick look on GitHub, I found around 1,000 implementations. I just used the search function. I didn't, I didn't go through each one. Uh, so it's just an estimate, about 1,000 implementations of Paxos. So in this talk, I'm going to use the word Paxos to uh, describe the algorithm. It's sometimes described as multi-Paxos, um, but these terms are, are kind of muddled and used interchangeably. Technically, the correct name is multi-Paxos. That distinguishes it from single-degree Paxos or vanilla Paxos. But since we're only interested in multi-Paxos today and it's quicker, I'm just going to call it Paxos. So that is the classic solution, and that is how the world looked in 2012-ish. 
Then came along the new solution, the new kid on the block. This was the raft consensus algorithm. So Paxos is famously difficult to understand. When I tell people, like, I did my PhD on Paxos, people are like, whoa, like, you must be magic. That's crazy. Like, how did you understand that stuff? Paxos has definitely got a reputation for being tricky. And this is where Raft came in. The paper was aptly uh, titled In the Search of an, uh, for an Understandable Consensus Algorithm. And that's what they tried to do in the Raft paper. So it was a new solution. It was published in 2014 at the ATC, the Annual Technical Conference of Usenex, and it, was, it did in fact win Best Paper Award. It has won, uh, won over a thousand citations, which given its age is incredibly, incredibly good. And having a quick search on GitHub, it has 3,000 implementations on GitHub. It is clear that this paper has been incredibly successful. This paper has brought so many new people to the field of distributed consensus. And in fact, I am personally one of those people. When I was an undergraduate, I listened to the author of this paper on a podcast talking about Raft. And I was like, consensus is really interesting. I would like to do consensus. Um, and I did a whole PhD in it, and I'm still talking about consensus now. So I really have been, uh, I really was inspired by this paper, and I really was one of those converts to the area of consensus, thanks to the brilliant work of uh, Raft. So given that the community is divided between these two algorithms, the natural question is, who got it right? Is one algorithm better than the other? And so one community got it correct and the other community are using a suboptimal solution. Is it the case that certain problems are suited to certain algorithms? So Raft is better suited to some problems, Paxos is better suited to other problems. Is it in fact the case that they're the same algorithm? This is something that some people claim and write in papers that Raft and Paxos are actually the same. Paxos is just a tutorial on, on how to implement Paxos. Uh, yeah, Raft is just a tutorial on how to implement Paxos. And it's important for us to understand these questions, to understand why we, the community is divided in these two algorithms. And when you're looking at consensus terms, you need to know which, which should I choose? Which community should I join? When I started thinking about this question, uh, when we were writing this paper earlier on this year, the first thing I found is that it sounds really simple, but it's actually a lot trickier to answer than it might seem. Paxos is famously difficult to understand. That was the motivation for Raft in the first place. So you need to understand Paxos so that you can compare it to Raft. But the papers themselves are so different. They're written for completely different audiences. Paxos is written mostly for theoreticians, and the algorithm is quite general. Um, if you're an engineer, you might call it underspecified, but <laughs> theoreticians will say, well, it's general, it's very flexible, gives you lots of options. Whereas Raft is kind of the opposite. It's like, do this thing, do this thing, do this thing. Here is a specific solution. You should use this solution. It's very clear what Raft is. If someone says Raft, you know what they mean. If someone says Paxos, it's like, oh, it's algorithms that kind of look like this. Um, in fact, we usually talk about Paxos not as one algorithm, but a whole family of different algorithms. If you look at two different papers, my own papers included, um, which describe Paxos, you'll see that every description of Paxos is just like a little bit different. So you have to actually, we have to actually nail down what is Paxos and how do we compare it fairly against Raft? And that's the important thing. We want to be really fair in this comparison. The papers were written at very, very different times. Systems look different. They're for different audiences. So how do we deal with all that and deal with it in a way that's fair? So just a few images from the papers. You can literally see the difference, right? We've got the part-time parliament paper. It's in Greek. <laughs> And we've got the Raft paper, which looks very much like a normal paper. We see things we're familiar with. There are RPCs, there are servers. It's all very usual. Look, there's some graphs. Isn't that great? Um, none of this weird Greek theory stuff on the other side. So how does Raft solve the understandability issues with Paxos? It clearly does solve the understandability issues. The stats I showed earlier show that it's been very, very successful and people really do love it. And I'm, I'm actually one of them. 
So the way that it does this is on three different layers. Firstly, presentation. So the raw, the raw paper takes a very different approach to presenting consensus. The presentation approach is very pragmatic. It's very focused on engineering. It's very focused on solving the problem of state machine replication that we talked about at the beginning. So for example, uh, the terminology is different. So in RAF, we have messages called request votes and append entries. In Paxos, we have things called 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, and 3, or prepare, promise, pros, commit, and accept. So you can see just with that example that RAF is trying to simplify things and is trying to focus heavily on engineering. The presentational differences, however, are like very surface level. So on the next layer down, we've got the simplification. So the RAF paper was totally honest and upfront and said, we are going to prioritize understandability. We're trying to come up with the simplest solution we can, even if that means sacrificing performance. If we have a choice between the two, we're going to choose understandability. And you can see that in the design of the algorithm. So RAF uh, Paxos, for example, allows you to decide operations in that replicated log out of order and you can end up with gaps in the log that you then need to fill and whilst like we can do this and this in fact can be very a very efficient way of building consensus systems it's not very simple raf takes a radically different approach and says actually we're never having gaps we're going to do everything in order one thing after the other after the other and this is actually quite powerful because it makes it a lot simpler and allows us to basically remove a whole chunk of the consensus algorithm that's dealing with filling in gaps. However, the simplification steps don't fundamentally change the algorithm, and some many of them have been seen before in other algorithms. Finally, we have the differences to the underlying algorithm. So this is, if we take away the small kind of simplification, if we take away the presentational differences, how do these two algorithms compare fundamentally how do they two, how do they compare are they solving consensus in the same way and this is what i wanted to find out the answer to so the way that i decided to approach this in this paper and i think this was in hindsight a really um good was to source and raftify it so let's take the Paxos algorithm, this famously difficult thing. Let's take the excellent presentation and the pragmatic approach of Raft, and let's bring them together to give an algorithm that has all the same terminology as Raft and looks on the surface similar, but is fundamentally Paxos underneath. And once we've got this, we can now compare Raft and Paxos evenly and fairly and understand how they compare. So you don't need to read this text. This was just a screenshot from the paper that shows our summary of the Paxos algorithm. And if you're familiar with Raft, you'll see familiar terminology. So we're talking about terms, logs, commit indexes, request vote RPC, append entries RPC, etc. So before I go on to talk about our Raftified Paxos and how these algorithms uh, differ, I want to take a little break and just see if anybody has any burning questions or clarifications um, that they would like before we move on. No, I don't see any uh, any question in the chat, uh, but I have to say what you do, it's significant and uh, I, I think all the community really appreciate your work. So that, that's amazing and that's, uh, that's basically what we looked for uh, for decades. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right, well, that's wonderful. Thank you. That was also just an excuse for me to drink some coffee. <laughs> So, a big question is, how do Raft and Paxos differ, sorry, the slide, slides are a bit delayed, differ in their approach to solving distributed consensus? This is really important for us to understand, and it's not just about choosing between Raft and Paxos. If we can understand how these algorithms differ, if we can bridge these two communities, then we have many thousands of papers on Paxos about how to optimize Paxos that we could potentially apply to Raft. Isn't that amazing? We, instead of having these two communities doing their own work separately, 
we can unify them, we can bring them together and they can share all these optimizations and share all this work. So let's start with a high level approach to distributed consensus. This is the kind of bird's eye, the bird's eye view. So we've got in this case, five servers and one of them is our leader. We'll get to the details of how we chose a leader in a bit, but I gave them a little crown to show that they're the leader and clients are going to come along. They've got operations for their state machine and they're going to send it to the leader. The leader is then going to add this operation to its copy of the replicated log and it's going to ask the other servers in the system to do the same. And it's going to do this with a message known as append entries. These servers are going to add the entries and they're going to respond. And once a majority of servers have added the entry, then the leader can safely commit the entry to its state machine and respond to the client. In the absence of any messages, the leader should make sure to regularly communicate with the servers to let, to let them know that it is still live and it is still there. I am the leader, I am in charge. No, you know, nobody's, nobody's gonna take my place. However, at some point, it's gonna fail. Like I said at the beginning, it's not a matter of if something fails, but when. So when the leader fails, other, the other server, one of the other servers needs to step up and takes its place. And the way that it does this is it when it detects the leader fails because it hasn't received a message, that append entries message from the leader in a while, it's gonna step up, it's gonna become what we'll, I'll talk about later is a candidate. It's gonna ask the other servers, vote for me, vote for me using a message which is creatively named request votes. And the servers, if they vote for the server to become a leader, they, the leader, the server will then step up and become a leader if it's got positive votes from a majority of the servers in the system. So let's now kind of take a step down and look at how the appending entries actually works. I should say at this point, um, I know this looks very Rafty to anyone who's familiar with Raft already, but I'm talking about Raft and Paxos. I'm going to use the colors blue and uh, blue and red show when I'm talking about one of the algorithms. I'm still talking about both the algorithms. So how does the leader actually copy operations onto other servers and then get them committed? So here's a simple example. We've got three servers. Um, uh, server two is the leader and each of these servers has a log which contains operations. I don't want to get too deep into the details of, of what operations are um, because we can support many different types of applications with state machine replication but so instead I've just used like random letters to, to denote operations and the logs also have these little arrows on the top this is the commit index so this shows um, how much of the log has been finalized this shows where the state machine has got up to. It shows when it's safe to apply an operation to the state machine. And you can see that the commit index is uh, very slightly. So the leader's commit index is, is one higher than the other servers. The leader, when they get an operation, in this case K, is going to append it to the end of the log. And then they're going to send the append entries RPC to the other two servers. These servers are going to do the same thing. They're going to append that operation K to the end of their logs, and they're gonna respond positively to the leader. And the leader therefore updates their commit index and applies the operation K to their state machine. The append entries message also includes the leader's commit index. And this is how the leader lets the other servers know when it's safe for them to apply a uh, operation to their state machine. So the next figure from this, you would see server one and server three also applying the operation K. So at some point, a leader a follower is going to fail. Like I said, uh, not a matter of if, but when. So how do we handle follower failures? Well, as I said before, when it comes to append entries, we only need a majority of servers to append the entry for us to safely commit it. So when the server's down, we don't actually have any problems as long as it's a minority of servers that are down. Question arises, what happens when the server comes back up? We could end up with a situation a bit like this. So we've got our three servers and it's similar to before, except that you can see that 
Server 3 is actually quite behind. They've only got one entry, which is X, and their commission index is still at zero. Like, they literally haven't applied any operation yet. So they're still waiting to find out about what's happened in the log. So the leader is going to send an append entries for this operation K to both Server 1 and Server 3. Server 1 is going to append that entry, and that's going to be great. Server 3, however, is not. So the way that the, the both Raft and Paxos, or both uh, Raft and Raft by Paxos work, is they don't allow gaps in the log. So you're only going to append an entry to your log if your log so far is the same as the leader's. And that check here is going to fail. So the server's going to respond to the leader and say, nope, can't append that entry, try again. The leader's going to step back and try again, this time with more entries. They're going to try and bring that server up to date. And that's what we see here in this final diagram, which is the, what, what the system would look like in the end. So we've seen that server 2 has sent to server 3 the operations T, the operation Q, and the operation K. And that message also included the updated commit index. So, so far in this talk, I have just assumed that we have one static leader. Um, unfortunately, that's not how the world works. It's not a matter of if things fail, but when. So now we're going to look at how we can handle leader failures. Before we do that, however, I'm going to introduce two concepts. Firstly, the notion of terms. So we need a way to distinguish between different periods of leadership. We can't use clocks because we don't trust that the clocks are synchronized. So what we're going to do is we're going to have these things called terms. They're just integers and they represent different periods of leadership. So each leader will serve for one term. And conversely, each term has at most one leader. Every server stores the current term so that it's got a record of what it believes the term is at the moment. Initially, all of these are, all servers are in term one, and then that term is going to increase gradually over time. One of the two ways that it can increase is through, via RPCs. So we include the term in every single RPC, and when a server receives an RPC, it checks what the term is. The term is higher than its own term, then it's going to update current term and increase it. Lower than its current term, then it's going to respond negatively to the RPC and include its current term so that the sender can update themselves. So over time, the terms just grow and grow in the system. At any given server, their, their current term is only ever going to increase. This just increases monotonically over time. So we can update our figures from before to now include this notion of terms. So here we have three servers again, and each of these servers has a term. In this example, two of them are in term four, uh, and the last one is in term one. We're also going to update our log. So now, instead of just having commands in our log, we're also going to have terms. So each log entry is a pair consisting of the term and the command. And we're going to use this term uh, we're going to use the combination of the term and the index to check whether logs are consistent efficiently when we're doing our append entries. So, so far I've only talked about, I've talked about servers and I've said there's this thing called a leader. Well, when we have servers that are not a leader, we call them followers. So these are servers who are just sat there, they're doing what they're told, they will append entries when they're told to, Maybe they'll vote for candidate when they're told to. They're not active servers, they're just there. They're quite passive, happily following along. And the leader is the, the B server, the central point, the server who's responsible for appending entries. I'm now going to introduce a in-between state. So <laughs> this helps us with how servers get from being a follower to being a leader when a leader fails. And I mentioned this before, this in-between state is called a candidate. So when a server starts up or when it recovers from a failure, it goes straight into the follower state. In the follower state, it maintains a timer of when it last heard from a leader or last granted a vote to a candidate. So when it last, when it thinks that, um, when it last successfully spoke to a node. So when it thinks that maybe there'll just about be a new leader soon. If however, this uh, timer times out, then it's gonna step up 
is going to try to become a leader by becoming a candidate. It then asks the majority, it asks all the other servers to vote for it using the request votes RPC. And if it receives votes from the majority of servers, then it steps up and becomes a leader. If, however, whilst it's a candidate or a leader, it has to update its term because it hears about a new term from another server, then it's going to step down and become a follower. So now we can finally look at how we handle leader failures. The leader regularly sends append entries RPCs to all servers, <clears throat> even if it doesn't have uh, requests from clients, it can just send up empty append entries RPCs. These are really like the heartbeats of our system. If a follower doesn't receive an append entries RPC from the leader within a timeout, then it's going to become a candidate. The candidate is going to update its term and it's going to ask other servers in the system to vote for it using the request votes RPC. If the majority of servers vote for it, then the candidate is the next leader. It is the responsibility of the consensus algorithm, such as Raft or Paxos, to ensure that any newly elected leader has knowledge of all previously committed operations. Now, you'll notice that this description is kind of vague, like I've said things like, the candidate updates the term, but I haven't said how. And that is because the details now do differ between Raft and Paxos. Everything I've said so far apply to both algorithms. That's actually quite cool. Like the overlap between these algorithms is quite substantial, but this is where they branch. This is where they take different routes. So we're gonna consider each algorithm in turn, starting with Paxos. The candidate begins by updating its term to its next assigned term. The terms have been assigned to the servers in the system in a round robin manner. So server one can use say term one and then term four and then term seven if we had three servers say. Next, the candidate sends request votes RPCs to all the servers. A server is gonna vote for a candidate provided that its term is less than the candidates. The request vote RPC in candidate emit index. The vote RPC receives positive all log entries that the voter has after their commit index. If the candidate is lucky and they receive votes from a majority of servers, then they will become a leader. But before they do so, they need to update their log. The way that they do this is they add any commands that they've see received with their request votes RPCs or any commands they find in their own log after the commit index to the log with the new term. Don't worry, I'm going to go through an example on just on the next slide. If there are multiple commands for the same index, then the candidate is going to choose the command with the greater term. This means that the point when the candidate becomes a leader, it will have a log with an with a commit index, everything after the commit index will all the entries, sorry, will have the new term. As I said, we'll go through an example in a second. But the idea of this is to ensure that at the point when the candidate becomes a leader, they satisfy this condition of having all the log entries that could have been committed in previous terms. So now for an example. Let's say we have three servers that are all in term two and they've all got logs that look fairly similar. However, the leader to, uh, server two has just failed. So server one is going to be the first server to notice this failure. And they are going to update their term to the next assigned term. So in this case, it's term four. And they're going to ask server three to vote for them. Server three will vote for them and will include in that vote the fact that they have this operation uh, command operation queue in term two at index three in their log. You can see uh, that the server one has become the leader now, and you can see that they've updated their own log. So you can see that the request queue 
has been promoted. So basically it was in term two, it's now been promoted up to term four. Once the uh, candidate becomes a leader, it can then go about the usual business of being a leader, which is to copy its log to the other servers using the append entries RPC. And this is what the log might look like in the future. And you can see here that the server one, the leader, has updated their commit index because they've already uh, committed Q because it's been replicated in term four on server three. Now let's look at an example where the logs don't all start out the same. So here we have three servers again. However, the top server is a little bit behind. In fact, it's actually got a different operation at its second index. So it's got an index two, it's got operation W term one. This is different from what servers two and server three have. They have the operation T in term two. Server one is in this case going to be the first server to notice the failure. They're going to update their term to the next assigned term, which is term four, and they're going to send request votes to server three. Server three is going to vote for them, but it's going to tell them about their log after the commit index. So that's the operations T and Q, which are both in term two. Server one is going to be elected leader. Sorry, it should have a little. It should have a little uh, crown on it to show that it's a leader, and it's going to add these entries with the new term, the term four. It's then going to replicate these entries onto the other servers. So we can see at the end that these log entries that have basically been recovered are now committed. So that is how. Raft handle uh, that's how Paxos handles leader election. Now we're going to look at how Raft handles leader election. All candidates begin by incrementing their term and sending request votes RPCs to all the servers. Notice that this is different from what we were saying about Paxos because in Paxos I said update it to the next um, next assigned term, whereas now I'm just saying you can increment it. So any a, a server can become a candidate in any term in Raft, which is one of the ways it differs from Paxos. The vo a voter will vote for a candidate, provided the following is smaller than its term criteria as before, that the candidate's log is at least as up to date as the followers. The way that this is implemented in practice is by, by the candidate sending its last log index and last log term to the follower. And the follower can then compare the candidate's log to its own to determine whether it's at least as up to date. So either the candidate is in a high, has an entry from a higher term, or if they're in the same term, it should have more entries. Just like in Paxos, if the candidate receives votes from the majority of servers, then it becomes a leader. The leader uses the append entries RPCs to copy any log entries it has after its commit index so that it can update its commit index. However, Raft does have an extra condition on commitment. When log entries from previous terms are recovered in this way, they are not committed until there is at least one log entry from the current term. So Raft does not do this like promoting log entries thing that Paxos does, but it does require that there's at least one log entry from the new term after the recovered uh, log entries to ensure safety. So let's take a look at a quick example. Here we've got three servers. And the leader, which was uh, server two, of term two has just failed. So the server three is the first to detect this failure and they're going to step up. They're going to become a the candidate. They're going to increment their term. So their term becomes term three. They're going to ask server one to vote for them. Server one will vote for them because uh, server three's log is more up to date. And server three therefore becomes the leader. Server three is then going to copy its log entries after the commit index to server one, and it's going to commit at least one entry from the new term, and then it will update its commit index. 
So we can see here the major differences between Raft and Paxos. In Paxos, you can candidate, uh, servers can only become candidates in their assigned terms. In Raft, servers can become candidates in any term. In Paxos, you always vote for a server as long as their term is, is greater than yours, but you tell them about what's in your log. In Raft, you only vote for a server if its log is already more up to date than your, uh, at least as up to date as yours. And finally, in Paxos, we promote log entries when we're recovering them from previous terms. In Raft, we don't do this, but we do have this extra condition on commitment. So how do we actually know that these algorithms are safe? <laughs> they're pretty, there's a lot of kind of subtle interactions that we have going on here. Well, both algorithms must guarantee that at most one operation is committed at each index. What we've got in this example is a case where this isn't true. So we can see at index one that we've got two different log entries, X and B, that have been committed. And at index two, we also have two different log entries, W and T. In the first case, these are from the same term. In the second case, they're from different terms. So we're now going to look at each of these separately. So we want to ensure safety within terms. So we want to prove that at most one operation is ever going to be committed per term per index. But in fact, we can easily prove a stronger statement than that. We can prove that only one operation is ever going to be added to a log per term per index. And this is because a leader in both Raft and Paxos requires votes from a majority of, of servers. And because of the check on terms, each server is only going to vote at most once per term. Therefore, there can only be one leader per term. The leader doesn't overwrite their log. They simply copy their log to other servers and append new entries to it. And therefore, there's only ever going to be one log entry in each, uh, at each index in a given term. The second part is to ensure safety across terms. This is the slightly more tricky part. So when an operation is committed, we need to ensure that it's present at the same index in the logs of all the future leaders. And the way that we can do that is by induction. So we can prove that if an operation is committed in a given term t, then for the next term with a leader that is greater than t, that leader will definitely have that operation in their log. If we can prove that between t and next term t, t2, then we can prove it for all future leaders. This is where Raft and Paxos take different approaches. I think this is really interesting because for people who say, well, Raft and Paxos are actually the same algorithm, Paxos is just a tutorial explaining, uh, Raft is just a tutorial explaining Paxos. Um, this would definitely uh, argue against that because you're, there, the algorithms here are definitely diverging. In Paxos, a can any candidate can become a leader, but the leadership election phase, so these request votes and including log entries in the request votes, ensures that at the point when a candidate becomes a leader, its log includes all the latest log entries. Raft takes a different approach. Raft says, actually, only a candidate whose log is already at least as up to date as a majority of servers can become a leader. Both of these are safe. Both of these provide the same guarantee, but they are fundamentally quite different. So before we move on to answering our original question, how I want to kind of review what we've done here. How do Raft and Paxos differ? So if you look at these two comparisons, the text is tiny. You don't need to read it. These are screenshots from the paper. But what you may be able to see is that some of the text is in red. That's the text that differs between the two descriptions. And all the text in black is the same. You can see that most of the text is black. There's actually not that many differences. But the differences, which are all limited to the leadership election phase, are quite important, particularly when it comes to proving safety. So before we jump into the final stage, I just wanted to check if anybody had any burning questions, clarifications, confusions, a break for me to drink some coffee, etc. 
Uh, yeah, we have a couple of questions, but uh, yeah, that's uh, I think will require some uh, slides and uh, revisit. Uh, yeah, Anton asked uh, why we assume that node one should be notified first that the leader is unavailable. Node three could also starting trying to become a candidate. That was about the raft part. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, multiple servers may detect the failures happened at the same time, and they may try to become candidates at the same time. In Raft, they are likely to become candidates in the same term, and then they may split the votes. So you may have a situation where, for example, with three servers, server one becomes a candidate votes for itself, server two is down, Server three became a candidate voted for itself. Neither server wants to vote for the other person because they already voted for themselves. And in that case, the uh, both servers have to restart the election again and try again. Paxos doesn't have that issue because a uh, server will only become a candidate in its assigned term. So if multiple servers become candidates at the same time, they'll actually become candidates in different terms. So one of them will win and the other one will lose. Yeah, but they uh, increase the term, uh, well, uh, kind of uh, independent uh, could be a case where uh, two different nodes have the same term and they word for themselves or something like that. In Raft, yes, that can happen. In Paxos, um, in pa Paxos, in Paxos the terms uh, are different. What, what? Hmm. So in Paxos, yeah, you can only become a candidate in the terms that you've been assigned. So if you're server one, you can maybe be a candidate in, in, in term one, in term four, in term seven. No one else will become a candidate in those terms. Ah, but they, they, uh, that initially assigned the term uh, bef before we even start uh, our processing, right? When we joined the class. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it's a static, it's a static division um, between the servers. Okay. <laughs> which means that uh, yeah, what, they'll, a server can only become candidate in one term. Uh, okay, so and uh, if, if we in process and some other uh, no, other member are joining, uh, so we uh, the leader um, gives him a term, right? Or how, how does it work? If, if we if we want to okay. dynamic uh, joining the uh, another another participants. That's a really good question. I'm configuration but in, in practice we don't need to use integers as terms we could use pairs that consist of uh like a just a normal number like a term and then you could add some id to the end and then you can use that to allow new servers that join as long as they have some kind of unique id they could then generate their own terms as well so we don't have to use integers as terms it's just easier to, to reason about them like they're integers. Ah, okay, so they, okay. Uh, they shouldn't be uh, one term greater than the other, right? So yeah, a, ter a term can basically be anything as long as you can always tell whether one is uh, larger uh, or smaller than the other one. Mm, okay, good. And uh, yeah, the last question uh, Anton asking, uh, is asking, what happened to V value on the first node lost? Uh, right, Anton, could you clarify, was it about uh, the rough part or praxis? What? Or, or we, could, we could take it uh, to the QA session on Zoom and uh, where, there we will check uh, the the actual slides and you could ask it to yourself, all right? Yeah, let's or, do that. Or, or, you, you, all right. Yeah, nope, let's, let's sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we've done this work. We've, we have raftified Paxos and we've got these two algorithms. We've seen that they are very similar in, in, in almost all ways, but they do diverge in how they handle leadership election. And therefore they have to take a different approach to safely solving distributed consensus. So now that we know that, which is the best algorithm for solving distributed consensus? Well, to answer this, we have to define what makes one algorithm better than another, uh, which is pretty, pretty tricky to do. 
So what I want to do instead is just have a look at what the Raft paper has to say about Paxos. So obviously the Paxos paper doesn't have anything to say about Raft because it came many years before it. But the Raft paper does make its own claims about how it compares to Paxos. Specifically, it says this, Raft produces a result which is equivalent to Paxos. Cool. Raft is as efficient as Paxos and Raft is more understandable than Paxos. So the authors here have chosen to um, use efficiency and understandability as the two dimensions on which they're comparing these algorithms. So I'll use the same two dimensions. So which algorithm is more understandable? I believe that there is no significant difference in understandability between Raft and Paxos. I know that this goes against the common uh, the common law, the common understanding and, and what everyone thinks about Raft and Paxos. The Raft paper is a much easier to read paper than the Paxos paper, do not get me wrong, but as actual algorithms, the underlying algorithms that are being presented in these papers, not how they're being presented, I really don't think there's a significant difference in understandability. If you want to, you could argue it one way or the other. You could argue that Paxos is more understandable because the leader only ever commits log entries in its current term, whereas in Raft, it might be committing entries from previous terms. Also in Paxos, if you know a log entry has been appended to a majority of servers, it's always safe to commit. However, Raft needed this extra condition on commitment. At the same time, you could argue that Raft is more understandable when a command is added to a log by a leader and it's given a term, it keeps that term the entire time. It will always have that same term when it's in the log. In Paxos, however, we may end up promoting it to a higher term. Okay, so that's understandability. What about efficiency? The algorithms, as we saw in that diagram, they are super similar, right? Most of that text was black. And so the algorithms, they really do only differ in how they recover from failures. So when people are talking about efficiency and performance, they're almost always, inter almost always entirely interested in the steady state performance. And in the steady state, there isn't a difference between these two algorithms. It was the same, at least the same between Raftified, Paxos, and Raft. But they do differ in how they approach um, failure. So if I have to choose a winner, I would actually choose Raft, um, which is kind of interesting because the paper said that they were equally as efficient, but Raft was way more understandable. I actually arguing the opposite is true, that they're equally as understandable, but that Raft is, is more efficient. This is because in Paxos, we have to include log entries with the request votes response, because we need the candidate to update their log to ensure that they have any log entries that may have been committed in a previous term. These messages could be really large. If you have a server that was quite behind, who decides they're going to become a candidate and try to become a leader, you've then got every other server sending loads and loads of log entries over the network to try to update the server. And practically speaking, that's not what we want. When we have a failure, we want to be able to fall over to a new leader pretty quickly and in fairly light way. We don't want huge messages um, going around the network and possibly even like overwhelming the, the new potential leader. And Paxos sends commands around unnecessarily because it promotes log entries from the previous term to the current term. It may be copying them and sending them over to servers when it doesn't need to. In Raft, it's easy to tell if two logs are the same and if a follower of yours already has a command because you can just check the term. But in Paxos, you check the term and it fails, so you send a command. But then actually, it turns out it already had that command. It's just that somebody changed the term. All that being said, as we were discussing in the questions, actually, Raft can be slower to elect a leader due to contention. So you may have multiple uh, servers becoming candidates in the same term, and they may split the votes and then have to restart the election again. This harms performance, 
both when it actually happens, because then it takes longer to elect a leader, but also because to avoid this happening, Raft has the normal timers for, you know, I have to hear from a leader within this window. And then they have to add extra timers where they pick a timer from a random interval to try to minimize the chance of this issue happening. Paxos, however, says that server can only ever become a candidate in its assigned terms and terms are assigned round robin to the servers, which means that you will never have anybody competing with you for leadership in the same term as you. They may be in a higher term, in which case they'll win. They might be in a lower term, in which case they'll lose, but they're not going to be fighting with you in the same term. That being said, I don't think this question is actually particularly interesting because both these algorithms are really naive. I've got in trouble before for saying that uh, out of co it was taken out of context, but I said, if you care about performance, don't use Raft. Um, and that is something I still stick by. There is so much we can do to optimize these algorithms. There's literally thousands of papers in this space. Um, I maintain a reading list actually on GitHub of papers in distributed consensus that has a few hundreds uh, of papers on consensus and how to optimize consensus. So we can do a lot better. And the issues that we have with Paxos that we discussed in this slide, they have been subsequently addressed. Although optimizing the algorithm comes at the price of uh, increased complexity usually, and often increased specialization. So instead of handling any state machine, you're specializing the application for a specific type of state machine, or you're specializing it for a specific type of system. So which algorithm is the best algorithm? Is it Raft or is it Paxos? It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the anti-climax. The differences between these algorithms for most use cases, they're just not significant. You want to use Raft, use Raft. You want to use Paxos, use Paxos. They're not that different. There's no reason for the communities to be as kind of divided as they are. Out of the box, Raft is actually pretty efficient at how it handles leader failures. And whilst Paxos can benefit from the huge literature, on optimizing consensus. Um, and you can, I, I do believe you can get better performance out of Paxos using this literature. And there have been various papers that show this. Um, if you just want something that works out of the box, Raft is a really good bet. So who does the award for the best consensus algorithm go to? It's not really fair to give it to one or other. I mean, if I have to give it to someone, I'm gonna give it to Raft, but I don't think that it's an important question because algorithms are so, so similar. Like I mentioned earlier, we did write a paper about this. Um, I suggest you have a look at our paper for some more details. In particular, the big thing that I have not covered at all in this talk is how our raftified Paxos compares to standard Paxos. How does it compare to the various descriptions of Paxos that you would find in the academic literature? That is something that uh, I talk about in the paper. And that's really important because once you understand that, you are able to benefit from the optimizations. Many of the optimizations to Paxos do apply to Raft. And so if you understand how to turn Pax, if you understand how to turn Raft into Raftified Paxos, to turn it into normal Paxos, then you can benefit from the, the vast array of Paxos optimizations, including some of the papers that I've written before in the past. So in conclusion, Raft and Paxos, they're not that different. In the steady state, they are the same and they differ only in how they approach leadership election, despite the fact the papers may look vastly, vastly different. I honestly don't believe that the underlying Raft algorithm is more understandable than Paxos. The Raft paper is brilliantly written. It's, ex it's excellently presented. It's got a very pragmatic approach and it focuses ruthlessly on simplicity. And that's really where the understandability gain comes from. I don't think it's due to the changes in the underlying algorithm. I think that you can write Raft just as simply by borrowing the technique of, uh, sorry, you can write Paxos just as simply by borrowing the technique of Raft and you don't need the underlying algorithmic changes. That being said, 
I think that the RAFT leadership election mechanism is surprisingly efficient, and it's quite a nice, it's quite a neat kind of simple approach uh, that avoids sending these big log entries around, which I think, practically speaking, can be quite useful. All right, that is it for me. I'm going to be free to take questions. I'm just going to pop up on the screen my uh, details if you want to reach out to me with any questions and on my web page where you can find all sorts of links to papers I've written on consensus, including this paper. All right, let's take some more questions. Right, thank you very much. I think uh, everyone uh, who who is watching at home uh, uh, have to give you some applause. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we have a question: Are there any papers uh, on comparing on comparing performance on of similar real world system built on Raft and Paxos? That's a really good question. What tends to happen with papers is they tend to propose some new cool algorithm and they will either compare it to Raft or Paxos. And there's sometimes some kind of sentence that says, you know, Raft and Paxos are the same, therefore, therefore we don't need to compare against both of these because comparing against one is sufficient. Um, I haven't seen much done in terms of like pragmatic evaluation. The problem with that would be the same problem as there is with everything, which is you would need to implement both of them uh, fairly from scratch in order to do a comparison. It wouldn't be fair to compare etcd against chubby. They're just fundamentally different systems. They have different goals. They're written in different programming languages. They're written for different purposes. So it would be very hard to do a performance comparison that was fair Against the two against the two algorithms, so you would need to implement both of them from scratch to do that analysis. All right. Yeah, and uh, while you're implementing, you add more bugs and uh, uh, imperfection, and that uh, I think become becomes more and more difficult, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That really and, uh, that really is the challenge. Yeah, and and uh, yeah, my my question is, uh, um, you meant uh, you wrote that a great paper, and uh, I think uh, th th that's really everyone who is listening uh, right now and uh, have to read and recommend their friends and their friends, um, and uh, so. But, but uh, the question uh, after reading your paper. Is it, is it possible to implement Raft uh, or implement Paxos like you brought, uh, you read the Raft paper, or, or it, it is uh, another goal and we have to find some something else and read an original paper? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's definitely possible to to implement the raftified Paxos that was written in the paper. Um, you know, if you started with a raft implementation, I don't, as you can see, like it's not that many lines of code that's actually different. You could reuse almost almost all the lines of code. As far as a Paxos implementation goes, it's actually a pretty, pretty simple Paxos <laughs> implementation because it's been able to borrow extensively from the presentation of the raft paper. Uh, wait a second, uh, a big question. Um, okay, I, I'll, I'll just read it. Uh, usually when people talk about Paxos and Raft, they discuss uh, in the... Con uh, con ah, that's this description. This description of your talk, sorry. Um, Guys, uh, I really look forward to your question in the uh, in the chat, and uh, I, uh, I I I have a question about uh, you. You told uh, uh, the cap theorem. How does it apply to yeah. uh, the raft? And uh, uh, so my my understanding of the cap theorem is. Uh, uh, <laughs> How do you choose one algorithm or another one? So, uh, could we uh, think about the cap theorem and choose Raft or Paxos for our systems? Or that's uh, unrelated and uh, that's nonsense? 
No, no, it, it is definitely related. So when it comes to the CAP theorem, Raft and Paxos are both trying to solve consensus, implement state machine replication. They are not sacrificing consistency. So out of the CAP, consistency is right up there. Um, consistency is being put first. There is some sacrifice in availability. So if a majority of nodes are down, neither of them will be able to make progress. There is some subtle liveness issues with Raft and the way it does leadership election. Um, we can maybe talk about it in discussion zones if people are interested. Um, a practical systems have to actually add an extra phase to Raft. But generally, um, if a majority of nodes are up, then it will work okay. If the majority of nodes are down, then neither of them will work. And in terms of partition tolerance, it's the same story. If there's a majority of nodes who are basically like connected, then they will be able to carry on. Um, but if you had a partition that, for example, split the system into two or into, into many even, um, the system won't be able to carry on. So in terms of cap, consistency is everything and availability and partition tolerance is kind of doing your doing the best you can. Mm. All right, got it. Yeah, and uh, one colleague of, of yours, uh, Martin Kleppmann, uh, uh, once said that cap theorem makes no sense in, in the current uh, world. Yeah. What, what do you think about it? <laughs> I guess he, he said um, that it's too, too, too strange, yeah, too, uh, too, too dramatic. I, I do agree with him. I think that the, to me, availability and partition tolerance are actually kind of two versions of the same thing. Like availability is what you provide based on the failures that you have in the underlying system and based on the partitions that you have in the underlying system. The cap theorem also completely misses out performance. Um, which I think is just a huge, it's a huge oversight and even beyond that, you know, it's not like a lot of systems, they don't even just provide one level of consistency. They support multiple levels of consistency. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's much more nuanced than, than the cap theorem would lead you to believe. Um, I think it's probably overly, overly discussed and overly hyped for what it is, uh, in terms of, you know, interesting impossibility results, uh, the FLP result which proves that you can't uh, solve consensus if even a single node in your system might fail. That is really interesting, I think. And that comparison compared to CAP, that is an actual theory with an actual proof um, that is really useful and very relevant for distributed consensus. So yay for a FLP. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, and uh, Victor is asking, uh, does it make sense to talk about uh, single degree raft? If yes, uh, will be a conclusion about performance and uh, under stability uh, be the same? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, I really like single degree consensus. I think it's really, it's a really powerful abstraction. And the talk I gave at Hydra last year which was about generalizing consensus, that was all about single degree consensus. So that was it. Can we implement a write once register basically? And once we can do that, we can maybe build a total uh, replicated log, but we can also build all sorts of things. You know, it's so it's such a flexible primitive. Um, in terms of, does it make sense to talk about Raft in single degree? I don't, I think a lot of Raft is quite specific to the log structure. And so I don't think it makes a huge, um, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to talk about it in the single degree sense. Um, performance wise, single degree does perform quite differently from uh, multi degree. So I think the performance would look super different. And understandability wise, a lot of the understandability gain from Paxos comes from the description, which is not just simple, but is pragmatic. And so it's very focused on state machine replication. It's very focused on multi-degree. Whereas I think one of the mistakes in, in the Paxos literature is to focus on single degree and then try to, to modify it to make it work for multi-degree. Right, good. And uh, what are the benefits uh, of using that single degree in, in Roth, for example? The benefits of single degree in Raft, well, so you'd have to do it to, to see 
uh, whether whether it's beneficial or not. But the benefits of single degree in Paxos are that it's a very you get a very flexible primitive. So you can basically if you can create an immutable right once register, you can build whatever you want. Instead of deciding a total order, decide a partial order, decide a set of things. There's there's so much that you can do. The world is your oyster. Um, you're not locked into this kind of replicated log state machine replication way of thinking about things. Yeah, I said that. Uh, that's nice. Thank you. Um, the second, I'll find uh, another. Other questions? Yeah, uh, you. I sorry. I mentioned about your um, paper, uh, flexible paxos. Um, the question: um, Could we see any uh, anywhere the, that flexible paxos in action, or just an abstraction that uh, the people use? Oh yes, you can definitely see flexible paxos in action. So um, Facebook use it in production. They use it in a system called Log Device, and they've open sourced the system, so you can read about it, you can deploy it yourself. So uh, if you have a look online for log device Facebook, you can see it. Um, it's also been used in, it's been it's been used in various research papers. Basically, you know, flexible Paxos is a theoretical result really about consensus algorithms. But what's happened is a bunch of really great engineers have taken it, they've used it to implement for example, efficient geo-distributed consensus. So when you're trying to achieve consensus across different data centers, um, I can I can look up some some links and uh, copy them into the chat for people specifically who are interested. But there are various papers that take it and basically implement it and made their implementations open source as well. So yeah, people people do use a flexible pack source uh, in production. It's mostly about taking the theoretical result though and turning it into something useful. But yeah, I've uh, I've sent a link. Yeah, I've sent a link uh, on that you uh, you described. All right, thank you, thank you very much, Heidi, for your talk, and thank you, Ivan, for supporting uh, with the Q and A uh, session after the talk. Uh, I guess everyone will be really glad to see you there in the zoom link where they can ask you more question and maybe talk a bit more and have more freedom uh, to talk to you <laughs> so thank you very much and see you there thank you very much thanks bye see ya. bye bye